Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, thanks, Gillian, for the very um, vivid and uh, concrete introductory keynote session, keynote speech for this um, morning. Uh, we have an hour time to give examples and stories of these four activists in uh, different stages of life um, present. Uh, we certainly will make sure that there is enough space for you, the audience, uh, international guests, and also those who came from Berlin to be here today to give uh, questions, comments, and answers to the panel. Um, I'd like to first introduce who is sitting here with us. Katarzyna Szmilijewicz is from Poland. She's a human rights lawyer and activist. She co-founded the Panopticum Foundation, and uh, this is an NGO working on surveillance issues, and uh, was very, very um, essential and crucial in the uh, also successful anti-ACTA campaign in Poland. Thanks for being with us. Jillian was just introduced. Um, thanks again for being here from the States. Markus Beckedahl is with the Digitale Gesellschaft, an organization who seems to be, which seems to be very, very present in this audience. Yesterday evening also it was people from Digitale Gesellschaft were everywhere. He founded New Thinking Communications GmbH in 2003, has been blogging since more than 10 years on netzpolitik.org about politics in the digital society and is uh, an expert in the Enquete Commission, the Study Commission of the German Bundestag on Internet and Digital Society. Um, thanks for being here, Markus. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, Ralf Fuchs. Ralf is the executive director of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the foundation of the Green German Party, which is uh, uh, hosting this event. This is our, our building, our office. Um, our, our headquarters, as we, as we say, um, for the work we do internationally and nationally here in Germany. He has been um, in the executive board of the foundation since '96, and um, is a long-time standing Green Party activist, um, including stages of his life where he was um, a Green Minister in a state government um, in Germany and also the co-president for the National Green Party. Um, Ralf certainly has been working a long time also before the internet even was born for political activism. So that makes it interesting to have you here. Thanks, Ralf. Um, let me start with the first round of questions on um, the issue of, uh, again, how actually the possibility to do online process protests change your life and how it influenced the work you have been doing in your different spheres. And I would like to start with Katarzyna again, um, who, as I mentioned before, um, was one of the key initiators in the anti-ACTA campaign in Poland in 2011. What kind of success, of, uh, a likelihood of success would have had the anti-ACTA campaign, Katarzyna, without the internet? Tell us. Uh, well, the question seems to be quite rhetoric rhetorical, right? Uh, <laughs> there would not be an uh, ACTA campaign without the internet. We wouldn't even know about ACTA probably without the internet because for quite a while it uh, was not an uh, issue that people uh, knew about. Uh, very few people knew about that and uh, the leaks uh, about the, the text of ACTA, they started in the internet. I mean, everything started there. Uh, I think we will we will talk later on about the complicated dynamics between online and offline. So I don't want to stress now that online is everything we, we should be doing and what have been done about ACTA because it wasn't the case. But certainly it was, I mean, there was there would be zero chance to, to do anything about ACTA without the net and on very different levels. So I already mentioned the leaks. So the co the, the fact that people cooperated internationally in gaining and sharing knowledge was the first stage. Without gaining and sharing knowledge, nobody would know about the threat for the internet. So that's the first stage. The second stage, of course, is uh, mobilizing in the sense of uh, telling people something is wrong, you should be become more active. And that process with ACTA took years. 
years. I mean, there are many people in this room, and I'm not uh, really like uh, the, the longest. <laughs> um, I mean, my experience with fighting ACTA is not the longest one if I look at this room, so I don't feel very really comfortable about uh, describing this process. Uh, we, we came quite late. My foundation started acting on ACTA maybe one year before it became big, but Jeremy started, I believe, a while earlier, and some other people as well. So when I started my foundation, I learned about ACTA from already people who are active in internet society circles and I learned about the leaks from the WikiLeaks and all this. So all these communities, they were instrumental to bringing that issue to, to the broader audience. And only on that thing, we started building our little campaigns step by step. Back then, two years ago, nobody really believing that it has any chance at all because it was so complicated, so technical, so karmatic that we thought in Poland at least that it's absolutely lost case. Nevertheless, we were doing our stuff and we were doing this online because it was easy, it was cheap. So we were producing documents, we were producing appeals, we were producing letters, which we would never do without the internet because it would be simply too expensive to produce them and, and uh, send them to people. Via internet, it was something we could have done without much effort. So we did, and we waited. And we thought the case is lost, and then SOPA and PIPA and uh, Wikipedia protest came in the US, and that's actually what triggered the whole attention in Poland. The attention of the people in Poland would not exist if it wasn't for a US case, which got uh, communicated via internet. And only then m m so-called mass media, traditional media, uh, picked it up, right? So again, we had internet being absolutely instrumental to bringing this issue to the broad attention of everybody in Poland. Uh, and then there was one weekend back in January 2012, um, uh, right? <laughs> I'm going confused with the dates now. Uh, when things happened so quickly, so quickly that nobody including myself, would predicted this. So we were ready with our uh, letters of protest, with our uh, idea how to appeal to MEPs in European Parliament. It was all on our website. But, and we informed media about the fact that Polish government is going to sign ACTA in a few days' time. And I thought it will be news for one day. It will be maybe news on the first page of one newspaper, but that's all. That was Friday. And over the weekend, I mean, we really had to bring emergency scenarios into play because suddenly our website, which is normally read by, I don't know, 10,000 people, it was blocked because of the traffic because everybody wanted to get ACTA, anti-ACTA appeals. And again, that kind of dynamics, that kind of network effect is only possible on the internet. And the, another step that was absolutely instrumental to the whole thing in Poland was the, what, what hackers did. So, so Polish international hackers, whatever hacker community, wherever they they were, I don't know, they started blocking governmental websites. And that was a serious form of online protest. That's how I saw it. The government said that's a terrorism. And when the government gave it the name of terrorism, people really get pissed off. And only then they moved to the streets. So there were so many steps which could have happened only online that brought people to the streets and, and triggered the whole political process. Thank you so much. Um, Markus, Netzpolitik.org is the blog you have been attending to for the last 12 years, I believe. Um, tell us about how ACTA, for example, was also commented or pushed forward, and how internationally also um, you are uh, arguing and working on the blog. Yeah, Netzpolitik.org, I founded the first uh, blog in 2002, uh, and then the actual version in 2004. And it's not only my blog, uh, we have up to yeah, 30 co-bloggers, some of them are in the room, uh, some not. Um, we blocked the first time about ACTA in 2008, at a time where the first leaks appeared on the internet and nobody was really interested, or there were only some days of interest in mass media when someone found out that uh, um, it might be used to, um, uh, to search on MP3 players at the borders uh, for uh, illegal copies. That was a big media hype for one day, but the day after nobody took care about ACTA until a long time. And um, in 2010, there was, for us, we were still uh, working on ACTA, um, connected uh, with lots of other people over European digital rights, where Kasha is involved, Jeremy is involved, lots of other people are involved, and internationally. Um, 
Uh, but it was more a battleground in the European Parliament, and it was important for us to go to this battleground in the European Parliament and to do lobbying and try to block ACTA where um, the decision were be, uh, where should be made. And it definitely worked. Nobody of us uh, expected that it worked, but it worked um, that we um, yeah, had another two or three years uh, that there was no decision. And uh, I think um, the whole ACTA protest learned from a protest um, 10 years ago. It was the first time that there was a um, transnational European civil society organized only over the internet. It was a time in the fights against software patent. And when I heard your talk um, about the Sopa Pieper blackout day, um, I was wondered about the US view on this case, because we started 10 years ago um, um, a blackout day on software patents, but without uh, outside of the Linux community and the digital rights community, which was very small at that time, nobody took notice. But uh, for us, it was at that time very important to use it. And uh, at that time, we learned a lot about how the European Parliament works. And I think 10 years later, if you take a look who was engaged in um, the ACTA protests on the battleground of the European Parliament, you saw most of them learned how a parliament works and how you do lobbying at the time on software patents. And you, um, we also learned how to organize the transnational European community to get involved. With ACTA, we only had the problem, nobody took care, nobody was interested. And then the Polish started jumping after the uh, Americans uh, blocked their websites. Yeah, and in Germany, we had um, uh, uh, yeah, um, anonymous video, and lots of people thought YouTube will be blocked tomorrow. So 100,000 people went to the street. And we were totally surprised. We organized a demonstration here in Berlin. We expected 600. We didn't really believe that 600 came, but we told the police 600 might come. And then on a cold um, Saturday like this, um, there were 10,000 people outside of the street. And most of them were younger than me. So that uh, they could be my uh, sons and uh, daughters. <laughs> but they thought uh, they, uh, they must uh, watch television tomorrow if uh, ACTA comes and blocks YouTube. And um, so they went to the streets. <laughs> but. Um, as Kasha mentioned, it was, we were prepared. We pre were prepared and ACTA, nobody took care, but when people took, uh, took notice, they could uh, get um, information on our website. We uh, had all these informations uh, gathered with 100 people maybe worldwide over the last years. Uh, and without the internet, it wouldn't have been possible. And without the internet, it wouldn't have been possible that we get 100,000 people on the streets within days in Germany without any uh, central mobilization. It was totally decentral. Some uh, demonstrations were organized by pirate parties, some by anonymous activists, some by 16-year-old uh, school kids who did their first uh, political action in their life. Uh, some of them by Hedonistische Internationale and Digitale Gesellschaft, that's in Berlin. So it was totally a grassroots movement, only organized over blogs, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, of course. And uh, this shows how it might work. The problem is, after ACTA, everybody asks us, what's the next ACTA? How can you mobilize them all again? And does it work for other um, topics as well? And we can only, only say, well, we don't know. Um, we are working on di digital rights issues. So we know how to use the internet. We have lots of experiences. If the internet is involved in, uh, yeah, in a topic of regulation, then it's very easy to use the internet to save the internet. But we don't know what is about on other topics. That uh, um, yeah, other activists on other topics must do their own experiences. Thanks a lot. I mean, the ACTA example is a very um, stimulating and, and extraordinary example of how to translate online activism on an online issue to the streets, um, that you actually create the same numbers you have on the internet in the streets, which is amazing. Gillian, tell us, um, the US um, uh, is, uh, you gave us examples in your um, speech before. Um, was that um, also astonishing from, from, from the US perspective that ACTA created such a amazing success in Europe. Yeah, I mean, I think it, what, what was happening with ACTA in the US is that you have, I mean, in the US we've got quite a few digital rights organizations, um, but none of them 
and I, I say this honestly, being you know one of the ones working on these things, none of us actually understand the European Parliament system. Uh, and so when we saw what was happening with ACTA, we were like, oh God, what can we do? We have no idea what we can do. Um, and so, you know, we're also a member of the European Digital, Digital Rights Initiative, right? Did I get that right? Acronym. Um, and so a lot of it was just figuring out how we could help support and amplify the voices of other groups that were doing the real groundwork. Um, and so, you know, you, you didn't see the kind of protests that you saw in Europe, of course, um, but nonetheless, you still saw people going, okay, how can I help? Um, and I think that that's kind of one of those interesting things because ACTA, just like SOPA and PIPA, had global implications. It wasn't just a European thing. It had international implications. Um, of course, most of the work was being done in Europe, but at the same time, um, you, you ended up with people who were kind of pushed to mobilize because they realized that it would affect them. Um, and so, you know, you did have a lot more sort of, a lot more cross-border support um, than historically we've seen over campaigns like this. Thanks. Ralf, you are a long-term long -term activist, as I said in the beginning. Um, I was curious to, to see if you have a, a turning point, a, a point of no return in your political um, biography when um, there was a switch from going offline to go online and to actually do politics online. Tell us about it. Okay, my, my role here on the on the panel is uh, this uh, dinosaur from the pre-digital age. So, and and hard to believe how it was possible to to mobilize one hundred uh, thousands of people um, for big rallies in the seventies and and eighties, and and how it was possible to do this great democratic revolution in eighty nine and. 1990, the fall of the wall, uh, the collapse of the the Soviet Empire, and the unification of Europe. Yeah, it was. So I, I would say uh, it's not all about uh, the 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 internet, but uh, of course, uh, digital media and um, the 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 internet changed completely um, the way we are doing politics now and also the way the, the foundation is uh, working in, in, in different dimensions. Uh, it enlarged our outreach. Uh, we have more than one million visitors on our uh, central homepage uh, per, per year. It um, created an enormous density and speed of communication. Um, and, they, uh, and, and I personally can feel that, you know, that, that uh, uh, the circulation of, of information and uh, the, the multitude of communication acts per day is completely different from 20 years ago. And what Markus already say, and uh, maybe I should mention that Max Begedal is a very modest guy, but you have to be aware that he really is one of the pioneers of the uh, digital, uh, digital space in, 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 in Germany. And he's not only an activist, but he's a theoretical mind. Uh, and, and yeah, and I appreciate that uh, very much sitting together with you here on this uh, uh, table. So, but I think the, the most important difference is the, uh, the interna internationalization, which came with uh, the, 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 the internet. It, it created a uh, transnational public sphere and um, offered completely new opportunities for uh, transnational communication and, 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 and cooperation. And this is also the case with us as a foundation. We are working with partners in more than 60 countries all around the world and we are in a permanent exchange with them, not only through our offices um, abroad, but via uh, the uh, digital media. So, um, yeah, there is a completely new dimension for political activism and political education, which is basically our 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 business. 
But at the same time, I would say uh, some basic um, features didn't really change. If you are talking about protest, uh, again, it's uh, the challenge uh, to switch from protest to real politics in terms of creating a legal and political framework for the new digital world. So not only protesting against um, developments we, we don't like, uh, but uh, to become proactive and create the rules for this new common space, for this new public good, uh, the, the, the internet. And this is about doing politics in a quite uh, traditional way. You have to deal with lawmakers, with the parliaments, with governments. Um, you have to uh, win the, the public opinion um, and you have to reach out uh, to and, and build alliances with people which are not naturally part of uh, our ac small activist communities. So I think a lot of things changed, but um, basically, basically it's uh, still about uh, becoming a political factor in, the, in, in our public uh, um, life. Thank you. Thanks so much. And the, the relation between online and offline politics is what I want to get at the second round, uh, and probably again with Katarzyna. Um, is there any example where actually online politics in their success hindered to have a mobilization going on, or has that ever never happened in, in Poland? Well, I think I already said that uh, I do think this relationship is complicated uh, between the two, and I totally agree with Ralph that the bottom line is the same. I mean, we, we, we do essentially the same stuff online and offline, but the, the new thing is that is that the, that very dynamics, which indeed might, in my opinion, help or hinder. So, um, in the first place, I believe from my experience as a relatively young, small NGO with limited resources, it's very difficult to do both well. So you need to take make your tactical choices in order not to spread yourself thin and fail in both. Uh, in both, well, I do know, I, I do agree it's the same world, but there are two dimensions, so to say, the, the street and the internet. So being, at least in Poland, being active on the street takes totally different skills, resources, language, tactics, people you need to have with yourself, uh, you, you communicate in an entirely different way with people than if you want to mobilize them online. Like, I'm, I'm 31, I'm not, I do not feel myself as digital native, I learned internet a while ago, but I learned the internet, so I'm not born in internet. And again, for me, understanding the language, the maps, uh, the kind of dynamics, uh, it's very difficult. So with ACTA, for example, I felt like I'm not activist at all in, in this game. I was a lobbyist, I was an information resource, I was an expert, but I was not activist because I could not catch up with the, the dynamics happening online even though I was quite in the middle. So that gave me an important lesson that if we want to do things online, we need people who are digital natives who really get these tricks, how to create information, how to make it alive. Because as everybody knows, if you want to create a meme or a viral, you fail. I mean, right? It's not something you can impose on people. You really need to feel the kind of vibe. It's like fishing or, I mean, it's, it, it takes very, a lot of intuition and a lot of experience, which, for example, we don't have so much. So for me, the first lesson is that you really have to think separately about the two. And then you, can all, you have to also think twice whether you really want to focus online. Because ACTA was, of course, a perfect example when the two came together. But quite often we have a very vivid action online, which is not translated into into any action offline. And then comes the problem, because until recently, Polish government would completely ignore any petitions, any clicks, any kind of mess happening online, because for them it was just not relevant. Until they see people in the streets or until they see uh, something happening in the parliament, they are not moved by this. And with ACTA, things went that far as they went in Poland, because the government completely ignored online activity for a week. So people started with low numbers, and they were frustrated with lack of response, so 
the numbers grew and the activity grew and the hackers came into play and all this was happening because there was no political reaction. So now I believe that government learned the lesson and now they will react to on online actions as well. But maybe this is the case of many other governments. They will simply ignore it because for them it's not real enough. Right? And then we also have this phenomenon of people clicking, I like this action, I'm part of this action, and thinking that's, that's it, I'm done. And this is probably the majority of people clicking in various campaigns and appeals online. And that's a huge problem. How the clicktivism can really hinder serious political action. How we take these people and how we, 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 we fish for activists, for people who get more engaged in this crowd, and we move them to do something more. I don't mean offline, they can do it still online, like send letters, like, you know, blog, but they have to go one step further. If they stay with the clicking, it's, it's very often really means very little. And people feel, okay, I'm done with my political activism. That's very dangerous. And we have to uh, also per, uh, address this problem somehow. Uh, so yeah, I, I really see a lot of dynamics here, which I think are complicated and they deserve more discussion. Maybe we can do it later. Sure, Gillian, how do you, push people beyond the click into the street in the US? Sure, sure. So, uh, is this, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so there's uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who I think everybody knows, had wrote this piece, uh, <laughs> I see I see some grinning, um, wrote this piece a couple years ago, said the revolution will not be tweeted. Um, and he went on to not be tweeted. Uh, and, and this was right before, gosh, I think that this was written in like November 2010, if I remember correctly. So a couple months before, you know, the revolution was tweeted. Um, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not giving credit, I'm not giving too much credit to these platforms, mind you. So hear, hear me out. Um, basically, you know, he, he said that uh, the internet does not allow the strong ties to form that have formed in, in previous protest movements. And he was talking mostly about the civil rights movement in the US. He said, no, there we had, we had readings, we had meetings, we, you know, we talked all the time, we knew each other in person, we knew each other very well, you can't form those connections on the internet. That's what he said. Now, I would very much agree that you can't just click like and be done with it. And you can't necessarily just join a movement on the internet. And this is why um, I, I've been really critical uh, publicly about groups like Avaz that kind of uh, imply that you can do that. Um, which is not to say that they don't also do great things. But nonetheless, um, I think that the problem with Gladwell's argument is that he assumes that there's no way to build those strong ties online. And I don't think that that's true at all. Um, and so if you look at, I mean, this room is actually a great example. The things that will happen over the next couple of days, I guarantee that each one of the participants who's here is going to form a strong tie with at least one other person that they hadn't met before. And that's how these things happen. Sometimes it's in a room like this, sometimes it's through a network, like for example, I'm part of um, a, an organization called Global Voices, which has built up over the past, uh, eight years maybe? Oh God, I should know that, I'm on the board. Um, <laughs> but it has built up um, through, you know, essentially most people have not met each other within the organization. We've had five uh, global summits, I think, but the majority of these connections are made through mailing lists, to be honest, really low tech, like old school kind of stuff. Um, but people build these connections and then when somebody needs help, so we have like, you know, we had somebody last year who was in a country where they needed to get out. They were not safe where they were, they were an activist. Um, they reached out to that community first and we were able to help them get out of their country. That's the kind of thing that can happen through these networks. Um, and so how do you translate that into offline? Um, you know, I mean, to be honest, I don't always know. I think that, like I said in, in my talk earlier, I think that it really depends on context, but I think that building Building those strong ties is what, what matters in these cases, is having these networks. I mean, I think um, Edry's a great example of this, where you have, you know, I haven't met half the people. I'm meeting some of them today for the first time, probably. Um, but these are networks where I, I see what these people say on a daily or semi-daily basis. I watch these emails come into my inbox, and I feel like I know you. You know, I mean, I know we met previously once or twice, but, like, this is someone whose emails I see constantly, and I feel like, okay, I know what her, her issues are, and if something, you know, if something happened and she needed my support, she would have it. Um, and that's the kind of thing where I think that, um, you know, when it comes time to then take that offline, that's how you can do that, by building those ties. Thank you so much. Markus, you're involved in many um, digital uh, politics work in institutions, not only in the Bundestag, also with the UNESCO. You are um, lobby lobbying and advising um, different policy makers. Uh, where is the, the line? Is there a line between online and offline? Probably there is not even a line in your daily activism work? 
in my daily activism work, I am I'm constantly online, but I need to talk to people um, to explain them online. That's still, uh, that's still the issue in 2013, that we uh, need to build bridges to all the people who are in power now and who do uh, real politics, but who might not every time understand what's going on. Um, because the people who are online, they are mostly the, uh, the young people, the under 40 agers. Ausnahmen bestätigen die Regel. I don't know how to say it in, <laughs> in English. Um, yeah, so most of my work uh, is uh, on the one side uh, communicating online, um, yeah, organizing online, bringing people online together, but then I have to go offline to talk to people, to explain what's going on, to raise issues. And this is uh, our motivation in the work on uh, at netspolitik.org since lots of years that we always try to explain the issues and also bring some tools um, that the people read about something and then they can get engaged at once. Um, we don't have all the tools we need now. Um, I hope we will have more tools, but um, I think that's something um, how it works. Most of the people, they care about if they read something and then they get engaged. The main problem is we found out is that there are lots of topics people don't really care about. For example, ACTA, we talked about it, 2008 it started, until 2013, the beginning of 2013, nobody took a notice. But lots of people had to work on it. And then there came the momentum where lots of people got engaged and, and they had the tools, they had the information they could use, they had the information to go to their uh, members of parliament or to call them. And this was very important. But our main problem is there are lots of other issues in the digital rights field and in lots of other political fields where people don't care. In the moment we have the uh, European data retent, uh, data protection reform. It's an historic chance to, uh, because to get a new European-wide uh, data protection rule. Nobody takes care. Uh, of course, there are lots of lobby lobbyists who takes care, but in two months or in three months it might be over. If we don't get the momentum, then we have a problem. Um, then we have less data protection rights. So from our perspective, two, uh, two years ago, we um, started um, Digitale Gesellschaft because we saw that it's very easy if there's momentum. Lots of people go on a protest and the main problem was two weeks later, they didn't really knew what they've done two, uh, two weeks before. And uh, our um, main goal at Digitale Gesellschaft is um, to form an organization where people can work on issues which are not cool in the moment, but which are very important, and to write all the resources and uh, info materials and to create all the tools for the momentum if all the people got engaged or between these days that people can go to politicians, talk to them, educate them. I think this is our main, um, our, this, this should be our main goal, to educate older people to educate the rest of the, uh, the society who are in power, who go to vote, who have sometimes absolutely no clue, but who are yeah, so powerful and they are not mostly not really evil, they just have no clue. To actually prepare online for the offline momentum, I would say, to then jump over. Ralf, you're... Yeah, um, I would like to, to continue on some of the, 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 the previous thoughts. Uh, first, I would say, the, as far as I understand it, as a non-digital native, um, the, the, the internet created an additional uh, sphere, but it will not just replace uh, the traditional way of, of politics, not only in terms of institutions. Of course, politics is, is about institution building, very much, not only, uh, but also in terms, and you already mentioned it, uh, the, the need for face-to-face -face communication, uh, the need for having um, offline meetings, uh, the need to be present in the public space, not only in the virtual uh, space, but 
in the streets and and um, uh, in the squares of of, of uh, our uh, cities, um, and from. As far as, 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 as I can see, uh, there is a danger in internet, internet activity to, bec to become a kind of uh, self-satisfactory aim of itself. You know, that we feel that w we did a political act when we like or like not. You know, so, and we can fill our days with this kind of virtual activism, which is changing very little, if anything, in the in the in the in the real world. So, we have to be careful that internet activism is uh, not becoming a kind of placebo, a placebo for real politics. Um, then there is the uh, there are some problems with this uh, new uh, uh, political sphere. One of the problems uh, you, you you touched it uh, uh, by the way is continuity. How do you create continuity? Continuity in working on issues, continuity in campaigning. If you are looking to the history of the the the, the green movement in Germany. The success we are now uh, earning in the, the this great energy transition in Germany, switching from nuclear energy and coal to renewable energies, in in, in really big in 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 a, in a uh, enormous speed, this is result of thirty years of education, of campaigning, of lobbying, of organizing. And you need this kind of uh, stamina. You need this kind of continuity, and you only get it by building organizations, by building institu institutions. Uh, so it's not just about this kind of short-term uh, hype uh, for, for, for certain events. Uh, it's it's uh, a, a challenge of uh, building this kind of long-term political um, en en engagement. So, yeah. At the same time, what's on the internet is always there. Yes, and I'd like to open the floor actually to whoever wants to make comment. I th think you should probably spark. Probably you could shortly say who you are, then everybody knows who's talking. Thanks. Hello, I'm Vokami. I'm um, a member of the CCC and the uh, Digital Gesellschaft and the Greens. Um, I just want to respond to you because um, you, in my terms of view, you have a very, very big misinterpretation of what's going on. Because what we are doing at the moment is like uh, uh, we're basically fighting against something. It's not like we are building some sort of like 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 idea how it should be. It's really like protecting and defending the whole time. It's not like the Greens could do like uh, 30 years ago to, they were like, you know, like it was t taken by, an, by a different approach th than we have now. In the moment what we have is, we have like uh, always fighting against like stupid laws, fighting against stuff, just uh, things to buy us some time. That's all, you know? Because what we mainly do in the moment, and what's the main issue is not like having good ideas uh, how the world should be. It's more like uh, protecting and defending. Yeah? That's a really, really different. Uh, yeah. we, are, we are in different times. I don't think there is. A, I don't think there's a difference. Um, I'm, I'm quite aware of that, and this is just the reason because I want to encourage you to go from protest to this kind of. I would say constructive uh, than, uh, politics. It's the same with, with uh, the, again, the, the history of, of the Green Movement. We started with this kind of anti movements, anti nuclear energy, anti uh, uh, nuclear missiles. It was very much a protest movement, but then it turned into, uh, you could say, a kind of reformist. Uh, movement creating alternatives. It's about 
de uh, developing alternatives, uh, 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 translating visions uh, into um, like, uh, political strategies. Yeah, and 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 my feeling is that uh, this whole internet uh, movement, this uh, kind of of new activism, now is on a threshold. Yeah, for this kind of turn. Otherwise, you will not escape from this um, kind of defensive protest. You're yeah? preventing something bad. Yeah. It's not only preventing something bad. It's about creating something better. I think. I'll be quick, I promise. No, I mean, I actually, I think that, I think it's starting, to be honest. I mean, I think that, you know, if you look at what a lot of organizations are doing at the moment, uh, there is a lot of reactive work, and it's frustrating, and I've found this really frustrating as well. But I'm starting to see more proactive work, um, and much more envisioning of, of the internet that we want, rather than, you know, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad, let's shoot these things down. But sometimes, I mean, the way governments are dealing with it right now, it is like a game of, uh, in the US we call it whack-a-mole, but, you know, the, the game that children play where they beat the little animals that pop up at like the arcade. Yeah, it's like that where you've got to like shoot down all of these different heads of the Medusa that are popping up. Um, and uh, but at the same time, I think that it's easier. Reactive work is a lot easier in some ways because when you start to talk between like let's say U.S. organizations and European organizations or Egyptian organizations or whatever, and you talk about the internet that you want, you realize that not everyone has the same conception of that. Not everyone has the same conception of free speech or privacy. I mean, for example, the right to be forgotten terrifies me. Um, and so there are a number of different kinds of conflicts that exist there. And I think that you know we have to find a way to get past those and build coalitions around those and bring in stakeholders from other fields as well. That's something that our field has not done very well and that we should be doing more of. Marcus, want to comment? Yeah, I, I agree with you both. Um, so there is a lot of uh, reactive thing going on, but we need more proactive. And we are, we are doing it, but I, I also agree with you. Uh, it's more or less in the moment a resource problem. If you have only some people working on it consta constantly, and most of the people just react if there's something, a new shitstorm going on Twitter and they can click and next time there's something new on television and they forget about it, then we have a problem. And um, we did the experiences if we do proactive campaigns. It's lots, lots of more work with the same resources as, and we are on the same time we have also to defend lots of civil liberties <laughs> uh, which are in danger at the moment. So, but I think we will solve the problem. And I'm very happy that we have the internet. Without the internet, we were uh, doomed uh, at the moment. <laughs> Last on the round, then we have no. We have actually a list of, one, we have a list, list of. One, 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 one last comment. And I then mean, we like, have four people um, already in what's the What's the main uh, problem is we are talking about like uh, very basic things on one hand, which are very, very complicated to, to, to explain. For example, data protection in in uh, now Europe, just just take like two or three hours. You don't get it. What's the main issue there? We we just have to to fight against like uh, uh, companies from the U.S. which are trying to 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 do lobbying in Europe in in ways uh, we we uh, yeah, 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 we we never saw before in any political field. Yeah? And I mean, like I I watch through that. In terms of you know like it's uh, I know that the, the um, atomic industry was very very big and in power too, but it was completely different to to what we are uh, see right now. And it's like really about civil rights and stuff like that. And it's uh, and we are defending our uh, medium to 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 have it. And at the same time, it's our like like a medium to 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 do all the stuff. So it's really really different. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a, not really comparable to It's with a very it. tough struggle and it's a very big enemy you're actually facing. Katarzyna and then the audience. We have four speakers. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, on, on the issue of proactive and reactive, I, I, I do agree with, um, uh, with what Marcus said that we, we do need both and the, the latter, I mean the proactive part, 
takes a lot of resources, so it needs organization. It cannot be done by the spontaneous movements because it needs a lot of um, resource building in order to translate very complicated is issues into, into clear claims. Uh, so on, on that point, uh, I think we don't, we not only need to defend the internet, we need a good regulation for internet against, for example, big, corp big corporations. And here we need the state and we need uh, institutions to help us. So it has to be proactive. But that brings me back to what, what Ralph was saying about the continuity and about the difference in being organized and not organized. Uh, again, bringing the ACTA case from, from Poland, uh, we almost lost the case in Poland because of the fact that people, three months after the huge mobilization, they were no longer interested for a reason which was completely not clear to me. But we had uh, like 1,000% less people in being involved in the very moment when the European Parliament was about to decide. So what was the interpretation made by institutions? Probably people got convinced by our arguments and when we explained them why ACTA is not so bad, they already like it. So that only shows the, the big danger of having only mobilization without any control, without any uh, leaders, without any any spokespeople, because there were not spokespeople for the massive mobilizations, which could not explain. Nobody can explain these kind of changes. So what happens? Politicians get the voice and they start to interpret what, what happens online. So my third point is that uh, it, it, it's very important to find a way to communicate the online uh, mobilization to the offline world, which is a very tricky issue because the strength of the, net of the network is the network effect and the kind of self-mobilization. Nobody was a leader of a Polish mobilization on the internet. Nobody. There were very many centers. But the result was that the media were coming to us saying, tell us anything, because we really need somebody to explain. There is nobody online who can explain what's going on. They need a face and a voice. They need a face and a voice. And of course, I could not give my face and a voice to this movement. Nobody could. It would be uh, appropriation of something which was not nobody's. And that's the problem how to connect the, the nobody's network, which is extremely powerful, extremely vocal, but not, there is a difficulty in translating it into, a, in particular, in, in constructive uh, um, conclusions, and who should be doing this? How we elect representatives? Katarzyna, let's open the floor. There were questions back there, and there's a microphone somewhere. Gillian, help me. I see very little from here. Please, first. Hi. And introduce yourself shortly so sure. we know who you are, thanks. Okay, uh, I'm Bashir, I'm from Tunisia working with NGOs. Thanks for the panelists for their presentations. And I just want to bring in two points. First of all, of course, as you said, revolutions and movements do not start with a click or with a tweet or wherever. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's much bigger than this. Uh, you've said if there is a line between internet and online, offline, it's not a line, it's an equilibrium that we have to find out. Obviously, I come from a place that we say it's a newly made revolutionary thing. Well, it helped a lot, but it's not sufficient. And the other thing, it looks like we are totally blown away by internet and stuff like that, but the history showed off that these are, uh, how to say, measures that have happened previously. Probably internet and digital things are newly done with our, with our new era, but uh, with Gutenberg and the, and the printing invention in the 15th century, it led to the revolutions, probably it took 300 years from Gutenberg from the 15th century to the British Revolution or the French Revolution, but it's exactly the same mechanism today. It's just a tool, it's just a meaning that helps people to connect, and obviously we're in an era that things happen in a, in a second, not, not, not a hundred years. But history repeats itself so far, and uh, it's a mixture between digital and activism on the ground as well. Thanks so much. Right next to you. Um, yeah, hello, I'm Jeremy Zimmerman from La Quadrature du Net. I have um, uh, a, a reaction to uh, Ralph, uh, Mr. Dinosaur's uh, <laughs> uh, uh, comment. Uh, um, uh, it's striking to hear you say, oh, the internet movement must understand this and that. Because that's the point, there is not an internet movement. It's a multitude of decentralized actions and, uh, and that's what makes it the internet. And this is why it is not predictable, this is why you may think at some point that this and this should be better, but actually unless you do it, it won't happen. Um, the, the, the key here, uh, I mean, uh, with La Quadrature du Net for the last five years, each time we've been in opposition, we've been in proposition as well. We've been building a, a corpus of propositional uh, material to, to, to protect fundamental freedoms online, to guarantee free access uh, to the network, to maximize the 
sharing of knowledge with detailed in, in great length uh, proposals for reform of the copyright regime. So, and this is happening all around the place. Uh, I, I, I think that there is not such a, a strong distinction between opposition and proposition because what matters in the end, it's empowerment of citizens. It's teaching each and every one that with the free and open internet between their hands, they can do things. They can change things around. And it is about raising this political awareness and political to the sense of citizens who care about the life of the city, to the Greek sense of the term, not political to the sense of parties, because we don't need those centralized structure and what we see within the parties uh, usually disgusts uh, us. So it is about decentralizing politics and it is about the, the internet, there is not one movement. Thank you so much. There was, you were actually the first to Abdul Rahman had also raised his hand and there was one other person up here, that was you, yeah? Do you want to go first and then we'll pass it over, is that okay? Right. okay. Uh, my name is Abdul Rahman, I'm a journalist. And um, I wanted to, uh, I'll be probably the first to argue with Ralph on the building of institutions. Um, yeah. Great, no problem. Um, so as a journalist, I had a front seat with what happened in the Arab world. and. Uh, um, I think it, it depends on what, what stage is that society in terms of representative democracy. Here in Germany, I think you can afford to be to protest against certain things, but in the Arab uh, in the Arab world, uh, the the Arab Spring, what had happened is the young people who were working for years and it started the revolution. Once the revolution had achieved the first aim, which is to remove the head of his uh, the head of the state. Um, they needed to go to elections. And other people won the elections. And today, not many people are listening to the activists. Or at least they, not, they don't have as much voice. And a lot of the people in the streets are saying, well, we, we had achieved the first thing. The head of the state is gone. So what do you guys want? So what would have been very important for them is to build institutions, parties, being able to go to elections and come up with a, a full alternative uh, other than, let's go out. Hey, uh, I'm Maria. I uh, work for the Open Knowledge Foundation in Germany. And um, yeah, thanks for um, uh, letting us uh, listen to your very interesting conversation. It seems to be something in the Bell Foundation building that every time I come here, there's something inspiring going on. Um, I'd like to uh, make a quick remark on uh, two questions you asked at the very beginning. The first was how to turn protest into political action, and the second one was how to transform online to offline, and it made me feel like uh, protest is online and political action is offline, and I'd really like to disagree with that point because, for example, at the Open Knowledge Foundation we work um, at uh, fighting for practical transparency. For example, we run uh, the Germany's biggest freedom of information request portal, and that is something happening online, which is much more than clicks. Um, it has a different quality, but I totally agree that we have, and this may be a very German discussion, we have to become much better in uh, explaining why this is actually relevant, what we're doing, and that this actually is political action, even though we use online mechanisms. Thank you so much. Thanks for these comments. Uh, for me, these kind of discussions are always are a learning experience. So, but still, I want to stick to to one uh, main main argument. It's absolutely true. There is, of course, by nature of the media, there is not just uh, such a thing as the internet movement. Uh, it's inherently decentralized, it's a multitude, as you uh, said, of, of actors and activists. But uh, the, the challenge is how uh, to um, create common action from this multitude of activists. Uh, because becoming politically relevant um, needs these kind of 
um, coordination and uh, collective, I would say collective action, collective action. And not just for three uh, days or three weeks, but for a very long term uh, of campaigning, of lobbying, and of turning constructive in uh, the meaning of uh, creating proposals, alternative uh, political concepts, um, influencing lawmaking. Because I'm convinced that we now are in a new um, phase, in a new period of the development of the internet. It is very much about regulation. It's not just the, the alternative between a completely unregulated free space and censorship. This was a little bit too simplistic. It's about how the, inter how the internet will be regulated, which will be the legal and political framework. And this needs this kind of, I would say, constructive uh, and, and proactive political action I'm, I'm, I'm talking about in a combination of uh, offline and online uh, activism. Well, I, I will only follow up because I, I do agree with what Ralph said, and I think that would be my, my, my last uh, kind of summary of, of what I think is the most important for me in this discussion is really finding the, the trick to translate the energy that can only happen online. I mean, we, we really have a unique resource, if I may call it a resource at all, uh, unique opportunity to mobilize people on that extent, to share, use our knowledge, to, to, to kind of uh, build a spiral of this energy which happens online. But if we don't learn how to translate this into both constructive and offline, which tends to converge, because we really need to get constructive when we go, go offline, when we go to the parliaments, to the governments, then I think we will fail in the long term because people will get fed up, I'm afraid, and they will probably use, uh, choose uh, entertainment rather than uh, clicking uh, in our appeals. So we really need to show them that we also, as activists, as organizations, we have propositions that push that agenda further, and we are no not just all the time killing the monsters that keep coming up exactly the same because that's like a you know never ending job and people get tired i get tired after three years and what will be in 30 years my god i think i will be mad already so if we, if we don't really go further than than this agenda the negative agenda it will also kill us uh so just just the final point on on the difference between lobbying and 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 uh, and activism i do agree that political activism happens online but Political influence is another thing. We really need people in the parliaments. We really, really need people in the government. And we can tell you later on a lot about the work behind ACTA, the work behind data protection. It really takes people to go to Brussels and talk to people. Without that last mile, we will never win because the politicians will tell us, yes, we heard you, and this is what we heard. They will interpret our voices if we don't go there. Thank you so much, Gillian. We have three more voices from the audience. Gillian? Pushing myself in uh, first, and then we had two other sure. um, raises of hands. Actually, that was a great transition, Katia. I'd like to leech onto that and moving away from this online versus offline and centering on the question, how do you actually create political impact? I would like to ask you and maybe Marcus, how, um, how do you feel like when, um, where's the boundary between you being an activist and you being a lobbyist? And when do you decide in your strategizing how, you know, we all have limited resources as people, but as organizations too, um, to focus on influencing political decision makers or really addressing the wider general public? Um, yeah, I'd be interested in moving more to that. Do you want to collect the other end? Then Inida, you're next. Can you stand up, please? Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, hello. Um, no, it's okay. Uh, I am Enida from Albania. I come from an LGBT organization, so lesbian, bisexual, gay, and transgender organization. I would actually relate to what uh, Geraldine said as well, because we are cornered to be an activist and a lobbyist at a time as demand matters. Um, uh, going back to the click, a click of 2,000 likes, let's say, in a Facebook page of homophobia, it's dangerous. So I was thinking about like the state uh, who controls the censorship in matter of hate speech and hate speech based on homophobia. 
in a homophobic culture and society, that is a huge problem. And as a lobbyist, I go to the state saying, like, uh, you're responsible for stopping this because you cannot uh, allow hate speech and propaganda against um, homophobia online or for homophobia online as an activist we report the page so I was thinking like how does this counter because mobilize mobilize can mobilize even like um, homophobic crowds because the LGBT community is not a political community not necessarily people who feel in the sexual minorities mobilized like uh, for instance, for in politics or for the environment, not necessarily we do mobilize. And uh, moving forward to that, uh, my Serbian colleagues maybe will help me to that. Uh, the flash mob that was done in Belgrade was hacked because people mobilized in the internet and hacked and took it off. And that was a problem. So I don't know like how can you go like for the bad and the good censorship and the lobbying and the yeah. advocacy. Thank you. Thanks. And of course, we'll be addressing some of those like cha challenges and dangers in the next session too. And you would raise your hands if you could also please stand up. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Silvio from the Federation of Young European Greens. And I would raise also another question, I mean, which concerns all, of, uh, all activists here. Because, um, I mean, I'm working in the digital rights field and so on, and I'm always trying to... to um, make other activists understand about this issue because it touches them. I mean, as you said just before in Albania, uh, also activists, uh, LGBTQ activists, um, also other activists, I mean, they are using the internet and they are using it more and more. And I think we need to make them understand that, you know, when we talk about digital rights, about digital uh, civil liberties, that it's also important for them and also making them understand to work with us on these questions. I mean, it's not just us. Uh, digital rights activists doing this stuff, I think we should work together with other activists because it's also very, very important for them, yeah? Thank you so much. Who wants to respond? Jillian. Um, just to, mostly to Geraldine's comment, but the, the idea of sort of activism versus lobbyism. I mean, I think that um, it's true, we can't do everything, and I think that it can be a real challenge to try to put yourself in both positions. Um, you know, I mean, it, I feel like I'm lucky enough that I work in an organization that has 40 people, and so, and, and ample funding at this point, and so, you know, we can try to do that. I mean, we do a lot of legislation, um, you know, or, sorry, not legislation, litigation, rather. Um, oh, I'm the native English speaker. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so we do a lot of litigation. We also do a lot of like, you know, just loud activism. And then, you know, we also do some lobbying. And so it's kind of all over the spectrum. But I think that, you know, that's kind of the point that I would like to make is that you need a spectrum. And while I agree with what Jeremy said that you don't want to, um, or well, I don't know that he said this, but I don't think we want to centralize this as a movement, but nonetheless, I think we need to build it as a movement. And I think that a lot of times what that means is that you find different groups or different organizations to do different things and to take different positions. Um, you know, I don't think that a lot of the activism in the US um, around digital rights would be as successful as it wa has been in some cases if you didn't have organizations that were over here, you know, kind of colluding with Washington and then ones over here that were just screaming really loud. I think that if everybody was kind of taking the same strategy, um, it, it would be much easier to ignore them. But when you've got people over here who are kind of, you know, doing that thing, the, the Washington DC thing, and then you know the people who are, again, screaming their heads off. I think that that's kind of where that um, effectiveness comes in. We won't all agree. You're not going to find everyone agreeing on every issue, but that's why you need that sort of spectrum. Um, and then the only other point I wanted to make was just kind of uh, to tack on to something else, and this will be my final um, thing. I think that the real role of the internet in all of this is scaling. Um, what you're talking about is, is, I mean, you said network effect, and it's kind of the same idea, but it's the, the fact that um, by using the internet, by using digital tools for activism, you can scale it so much faster. And I think that that's what we saw in, in cases like Tunisia, where um, that would have happened regardless. You know, this is not a new thing. Revolutions are not new. Um, but the scale at, at which it was able to, to, people were able to sort of mobilize and, and latch onto it definitely couldn't have happened without the internet, in my opinion. Thank you so much. The bad guys from the good guys, how can you mobilize differently? Marcus probably or Katarzyna, who wants to answer? The bad guys from the good guys. Um, yeah, for, first to uh, Geraldine, um, I don't really have a plan when I do lobbying or activism. It switches every 10 minutes. Um, but I 
thinking um, I do more lobbying on stuff which where I, we can't do activism now. Uh, lobbying on topics which will be activism topics tomorrow and where we can try to uh, to solve some problems now before it becomes a danger or we uh, we can try to educate uh, policy makers now before they get a uh, stupid idea tomorrow that's more the way and um, all the rest uh, we always try to do activism and because activism is for us some kind of educating people and we use the internet and we can reach a lot of people uh, in real time if we want and this is a fa 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 a fasti fa fascinating thing and but it's not only fascinating it sometimes um, causes some problems. Uh, the, the problem with the homophobia. Um, we saw it in Germany two days uh, ago. We have a, um, uh, um, a well-known journalist called Domian. He's a gay moderator on television. And he, uh, on his Facebook page, which is very huge, um, he uh, blocked uh, or Facebooked uh, about uh, the Pope and his um, opinion about the Pope. And it looks like um, that there was a big mobilization by Christian radicals who went to the Facebook page and reported this page. So the algorithm on, at Facebook thought, oh, it's uh, dangerous content, and it was killed. So it uh, destroyed. Um, the Facebook couldn't find it anymore um, because of some algorithm and the big mobilization. So uh, what I w would like to say is uh, mobilization and these cool tools we all use, uh, use, it's not something in general which is great for democracy. It also causes some problems we have to deal with. May I, may I raise a question? Um, immediately as a response to, to your argument. What, what, what do you think, all of, all three of you, do we need different kind of rules for the, the internet, uh, for, the, uh, for the, the virtual uh, public sphere, or is it basically about the same kind of rules um, preventing hate speech, discrimination, violation of personal integrity of people in uh, via, via the, uh, the net, um, even with respect to property rights of um, artists, uh, intellectual writers, those people who are producing the substantial content. I would say from my provisional uh, point of view, it's basically about the same set of, of, of rules. Yeah, no. Um, the, the main problem is first, um, we ha the internet is transnational. Um, so if you came to hate speech, Nazi speech, um, it's illegal in Germany almost, but in the United States it's not illegal. How would you like to deal it? Uh, should we go back to the uh, national borders and try to deal with it? I don't think so, but I think the um, more, far more important question is how do we deal with the privatized public sphere? I think this is a bigger problem, that there are companies like Facebook or even Twitter um, where we don't have really our civil liberties, we have a terms of use, uh, terms of service, and they can use it against us. Algorithm can you, uh, can be used against us, and this is a bigger problem um, in the public sphere. We have civil liberties, we have human rights. At Facebook, we don't have anything of this. Okay, Julia. one minute. Because we're coming to One that in the next round. I'll make it really quick. I, I agree with everything that Marcus just said, and the only thing that I want to add to it is that even though I think in theory the same human rights that exist offline should apply online, in practice um, censorship scales very differently. And so, like the hate speech example, again, not illegal at all in the U.S. It's completely uh, protected under our, our First Amendment. And so, um, when you when you look at that kind of example, what happens when you censor hate speech? I'm using hate speech in quotes because I don't think everyone agrees on the definition. What happens when you censor it is that it comes back like Medusa. I'm sorry for using the Medusa example so many times today, but it comes back. The Streisand effect, if you're not familiar with it, look it up on Wikipedia. But basically, I mean, I just think it, censorship online is not as effective. You could say something that would be constituted as hate speech in Germany privately uh, in your house and nobody would ever find out, but if you put it on your Facebook page, maybe you could get arrested for it. And we, I, I don't know if that's happened here, but we've seen examples like that in a lot of other countries.
Thank you so much, Jillian. There will be more time to talk about exactly on this on the next panel, I believe, which will be moderated by Jillian. Thank you so much no, for your great... Never mind. Sorry. Sorry? Okay. Not? Okay. Oh, no, Jillian. It's Sorry. I, I'm taking that as a Geraldine, huge compliment, though. Geraldine, <laughs> I meant you. Thank you for your participation and enjoy the conference. Yeah.